Joining me now is the Foreign Affairs Minister, Melanie Jolie. Minister, thanks for being here. An historic battle zone address today from, from President Zelensky. It was very personal, as you know, and I know you've been to Ukraine and, and you feel that, but it was very purposeful. He demanded more help. Those are his words. We want you to close the skies. What is the government's response to this plea that this, there's got to be a no-fly zone uh, to help the Ukrainians stop the Russian assault? Well, first and foremost, um, obviously, it was, like you mentioned, a historic address to to Canadians and to the House of Commons today. Uh, obviously, it was important for President Zelensky to talk to Canadians, but also to feel that we're with him and that we commend him for his, for his courage, his resolve, and, and his determination. He also said that Canada was one of uh, the strongest allies and, and a close friend, but we understand also that we can do more and we will do more. And so we know that he's been asking for a no-fly zone for some time now. What the Prime Minister and myself and other uh, colleagues have said is that we don't want to trigger an international conflict, and that's why the question of the no-fly zone is a difficult one, but is one that we can't address because it would trigger an international conflict. We're, we're, I want to get your reaction then to the leader of the interim leader of the Conservative Party, Candace Bergen, who raised the idea that in fact there was a, 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 a different way to do that, uh, and the Ukrainian charge d'affaires agrees, which is. Let's just have a protected area over humanitarian corridors. She somehow seemed to suggest that you could have a no-fly zone just over humanitarian corridors. I hadn't heard that before today. What was your reaction to that? Well, the problem is, in practical terms, Russia is not following any form of humanitarian corridors. They're bombing civilians, even when they have said that they would be following a humanitarian corridor uh, based on the negotiations that they're having with Ukrainians. We know that Ukrainians are trying to bring that to the negotiation table. They're trying to bring a ceasefire as well. I've been in contact with Mitro Kuleba, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, for Ukraine, even yesterday, and I speak to him pretty much every day or every two days. And it is an issue. It is an issue uh, because at the same time, uh, since Russia is not, you know, has been lying and lying again, well, there's no trust. And it is difficult then to have any form of humanitarian corridor. So the position of uh, Mrs. Bergen is one that in practical terms doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't work. So when President Zelensky says we need to do more and I understand the red line, and you've articulated it, uh, the Prime Minister, and NATO has as well. Okay. That th Russia then is continuing to bomb indiscriminately, bomb civilian targets, as President Zelensky said. And then he said, we need you to do more. What more yep. will be done? So in practical terms, what he's asking us is to do more also on sanctions and more on weapons. So today we announced more individuals that would be sanctions, particularly military personnel, but we'll do more. And I had a conversation earlier today, just after President Zelensky address with uh, Joseph Borrell, who is my EU counterpart, and we spoke about making sure that there are even stronger sanctions. The other thing also is obviously we need to have more weapons sent to Ukraine, sent successfully to Ukraine, and that's what we are doing. Minister Anan has been doing a great job on that, and we're coordinating also with other uh, members of the G7. Okay. So more weapons are coming. By the way, I know the G7 and NATO is going to meet now. I've just uh, heard Jens Stoltenberg, yes. the NATO Secretary General, said there's going to be an extraordinary meeting in Brussels on the 24th of March. So just confirm, more lethal weapons coming from Canada, and what is that meeting supposed to signal? What will that do? Well, it is important for leaders from the alliance to talk about what's going on in Ukraine, to make sure that we, again, are coordinated, that we work together as like-minded countries. We've shown very strong unity since the beginning of this crisis. And clearly, what we've been able to show is Putin has failed. Putin has failed because his decision to invade Ukraine 
is clearly not only a miscalculation, but a failure on his part politically, diplomatically, economically, at every single level of decision making. He decided to invade Ukraine and thought the invasion would happen within days. That was not the case. It's been 20 days. Resistance is happening on the ground, and Ukrainians are fighting extremely well. He thought he would divide the West. Clearly, this is not happening. We've imposed sanctions like never before, and we've been having a very strong voice, making sure that we really put maximum pressure on his regime. And we will continue until we're able to win this fight, because, like the Prime Minister said last week, Losing is not an option. Uh, two more questions, uh, Minister. One, um, also today, President Zelensky said that he understands that Ukraine will never be part of NATO. Now, that had been a key demand of Russia, Ukraine not a part of NATO. Um, what is your interpretation of that? One, has NATO said to Ukraine, you're never going to be part of it? Or is that a negotiating strategy? Is that a way that President Zelensky is trying to talk to uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin and say, OK, this is a concession to begin talks? What was your view of that? Well, we know while well, the fighting is continuing, meanwhile, diplomatic talks will happen and are happening. So clearly, there are negotiations happening. But as I mentioned earlier in the interview, it is important for Ukrainians to be very in a strong position while negotiating. On the question of NATO for itself, you know, Canada's position has remained the same. In 2008, we said we were in favor of not only of the open door policy, but also of Ukraine joining NATO. And our position has not changed. Okay, that's interesting, his comments. Finally today, the Prime Minister, uh, was among 313 officials who were put on a Russian sanction list, including you. So you're part of it. Uh, many uh, members of parliament from other parties, the chief of the defense staff, the prime minister. What is your response to being sanctioned personally by Russia, and what does it tell you? I'm not surprised. I won't back down. This was predictable. This just happened. Let's move on. What, what does it tell you, though? Because, look, it, it sounds like the West is in a new Cold War with Russia. This is, would you describe this as the new Cold War? And are these sanctions and the cruise missiles that he launched at the base where the Canadians used to be uh, training in Western Ukraine, very close to the Polish border? Uh, I guess we're in a Cold War, Minister, but are we moving potentially towards a hot war with Russia? Well, I said it many times. This war needs to be won by Ukraine. It is a question between freedom and tyranny. It is a question between truth and falsehood. It is an existential uh, question for uh, the international order. Now, um, Canada has played its role to support one of its best friends, which is Ukraine, because of our people-to-people -people ties, because of our common history, but because it was the right thing to do. And we'll continue to work with our uh, G G7 countries' uh, partners, because we all know that Canada is not a nuclear power. It is not a military power. We're a middle-sized power. And what we're good at is convening and making sure that diplomacy is happening, and meanwhile, convincing other countries to do more and to be part of this important mission of uh, really doing the right thing for the right reason.